Well, we're continuing our study of the book of Revelation, and we're going to take on chapter 19, which among other things has the big event, the one that we're all looking forward to being part of, Amen. the return of the king. And uh, we are, of course, in the third section of the book, the things which shall be metatauta after, that is uh, from chapter 4 to the end, and we've been through the heptatic structure um, in these studies. We've just finished with the two women, that is the second of the two women. We had Israel in chapter 12, we had the woman that rides the beast in chapter 17, we've just been through that. And we talked about the difference between the fall of Babylon and the doom of Babylon, the destruction of Babylon. And this is an interesting issue, not just biblically, but it's a test of our hermeneutics. If you take the Bible seriously, then you look for a destruction of a major city on the banks of the Euphrates, uh, that after which it will never be inhabited, the building materials will never be reused, and like Sodom and Gomorrah. Now one of the people I respect the most in this kind of thing in, in general is Dave Hunt's book, A Woman Rides the Beast. I might mention that he is so focused on the Vatican relationship that candidly he does not see any significance to the rebuilding of Babylon that's going on 55 miles south of Baghdad. So we, that's one of the places we have a difference of view. We're good friends. We've agreed to disagree agreeably. <laughs> but uh, uh, within, within the pre-trib study group, I'm well known for this view. In fact, I was, I was supposed to do the rebuttal of his book when it comes out, as we always do. We have some good-natured uh, uh, reviews. And, and uh, I pointed out that, that you know, some people take the battle, Bible literally. Some think it's a symbol for Vatican. I argue that both are true from Zechariah 5, which surprised everybody. But um, uh, the, the, what's nice about this is you can now just watch and see. If I'm correct, over the coming months or years, whatever, Babylon is going to reemerge on the world scene in some surprising ways. And if it does, it's, it'll serve as a litmus test that we're on the right track with our theories of interpretation, which is a very strict literalness of the biblical text. And uh, we'll see. Uh, most pastors and most scholars don't see it that way. This is a minority view, but um, we'll watch and see. We talked about, we went through lightly some of the highlights of Isaiah 13, 14, Jeremiah 15, 51, and we saw how it dovetails with Revelation 17, 18 in many ways, and uh, the idioms being very, very similar, especially between Jeremiah and Revelation. And the woman of the ephah, I think, unlocks the riddle because the woman called wickedness is sealed in a talent of lead, carried by two women to the wings of a stork between heaven and earth. And where does she take it? She takes it to build it a house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. I personally believe the woman that's labeled wickedness in the Old Testament in this passage is the mystery Babel and the harlot of, of uh, Revelation 17 18. Well, we'll see. Something else, we often talk about the restrainer, the harpazo, the rapture, but I want to highlight something. I think the restrainer may be restraining far more than you and I have any ability to imagine. And once the harpazo takes place, I think the events that uh, uh, are going to surface are going to be stranger than we have any ability to imagine. But um, we are now really in the final section of the book of Revelation. 17, 18 that we took in the previous section is, of course, Mystery Babylon. We are, uh, then comes the return of the king. The next chapter will be the millennium, and the next chapter after that, eternity, and then a final conclusion. And of course, we're in chapter 19, but we're getting near the finish line here. And uh, chapter 19 has the return of the king and also the marriage supper of the lamb. We'll talk about both. Let's back up a little bit. Every Christmas season, most of us will read, sooner or later, out of the book of Luke, the Christmas story. When Gabriel comes to Mary and he says, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. This is familiar to most of us. It occurs often on Christmas cards and what have you. Luke chapter 1, 31 and following. And he shall be great and he shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him, what? The throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. How many believe that? 
Okay. When you raise your hand on that, if you believe it literally, you represent a very small minority. Most churches adopt a, a, a viewpoint that takes that figuratively, not literally. The throne of David did not exist during Christ's ministry. Rome was ruling, and they appointed an Edomite, an Edomite, uh, in charge of that region. Uh, the, the Davidic dynasty was declared by God in in First Samuel seven as a, uh, uh, a, a eternal dynasty, and it will be eternal through Jesus Christ. But has he sat on the throne of David? Not yet. He's on his father's throne. The God the Father. But he has yet to take David's throne. And that's what this is all about in chapter 19. God made a promise in 2 Samuel 7. The Davidic covenant is there described. God promised David a royal dynasty in, in many places, including Isaiah 7. An eternal throne in many places in the scripture. A political kingdom was promised in Genesis 17. It was even confirmed by oath in Psalm 132, Psalm 89, and elsewhere. This cannot be applied to the church. The majority of churches in America have adopted a view that says the church has replaced Israel. Well, that's unfortunate for lots of reasons. It certainly doesn't, the church can't be applied to Ezekiel 37 and many other places. And the great tragedy of that particular viewpoint, it has a tendency to make God a liar. Because God made some very, very specific promises. It was this future throne of David that was recognized by the first church council in Acts 15. And uh, it, uh, Amos 9, 11 to 12 is quoted by James in resolving that council in exactly this context. So you might check that out on your own. The oldest prophecy uttered by a prophecy in the, in the Bible is of the second coming, what we're about to look at. We don't find it in Genesis. You'll find it uh, recorded in Jude, verses 14 and 15. And Enoch also the sent from Adam prophesied of these, saying, quote, quoting Enoch, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, Seems like Jude had a vocabulary problem, but anyway. Uh, and of their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. I don't think Jude indulged very often in synonyms, uh, but uh, we have ungodly there, what, five times, I guess. But okay. This is a prophecy of the second coming of Christ that is that was uttered by a prophet before the flood of Noah. It's the first prophecy in the Bible uttered by a prophet. And uh, I think that's interesting. Well, let's jump into Revelation 19. Again, we have the term metatauta. That is after these things, after the fall of Babylon and all that. I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And they all said, what? Alleluia. Alleluia. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. Hallelujah occurs um, 24 times in the Old Testament, four times in the New, which is a multiple of 28, interestingly enough. Uh, a multiple of seven, I mean. It's 28, multiple of seven. Um, it occurs about 24 times in the Psalms, if you want to go count them, in Psalm 146 to the end. It finishes the book of Psalms. Um, but we've got the dragon lady again here, the great whore. <laughs> and... Uh, Well, I, that pretty much summarized last, uh, last time's lesson. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts, or living creatures, fell down and worshipped. I don't like the word beast there. Uh, it's, it's a different Greek word. It's translated. We should say living creatures. The four and twenty elders and the four living creatures um, fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. Um, interesting observation that I don't notice most commentaries pick up on. This is the last reference to the 24 elders. From here on, I think we're going to see them as the bride. It's interesting that the, the 24 elders do not 
co-occur with the bride, which I think is another confirmation of our perceptions there. Verse 5, And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the voice of many waters and the voice of the mighty thundering saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. I think that part was written by Handel. I don't know. Uh, I'm being facetious, of course. Um, it's interesting. I, I, when you somebody have to do this is go through the book of Re- Revelation and find out what percent of the book is praise and worship. It's really, we, we sort of gloss over that for the other pieces, but it's, it, here it's really coming to a crescendo. Uh, here we have uh, a half a dozen verses that basically is just praising God for his, his uh, 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 justice, for his righteousness, and for uh, bringing these judgments. And uh, it's, a, uh, it's a, just a crescendo of worship and praise. I think that's cool. It continues, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is what? The righteousness of the saints. It's an idiomatic use, of course. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. This is the first of two suppers in this chapter. There's going to be another supper. Don't get them confused. <laughs> Many people do. Seriously. Um, these are the two sayings of God. Now, first of all, who is the bride? Some like to say it's Israel. Well, that sort of mixes metaphor. Because you'll find in Isaiah 54 and elsewhere, Israel is universally presented in the Old Testament as the wife of yah heh or Yahweh, or however he wants to say the Tetragrammaton. She is described as a harlot in Ezekiel 16. And Hosea, the early parts of the book of Hosea are object lessons that are really quite scathing. He is told to take a wife of whoredoms as a deliberate attempt to make a type here of Israel. Uh, Gifts to her lovers to prevent want. And uh, she's bought at a slave market. Hosea was to love her anyway. Those are instructions. And then he has three children that have special names. Israel is presented as an idolatrous wife, and Hosea has one that's called Jezreel, which means, the word means cast away on the one hand, but it can also mean sowed, like for harvest. You can use it either way. It's be, it'll be used both ways. And then Ruhamah means pitied, so he names the kid Lo Ruhamah, that is not, Lo being no, uh, uh, unpitied, without mercy, in Hosea chapter 1. And uh, a third child, Lo Ami, not my people to indicate that God is dis- disowning them for a while. Not permanently. Don't misunderstand. They're not permanently cast away. That's the whole message that's there. They will be cast away for a while, but the low Ami gets renamed. The low goes away. She, once again, will be uh, his people. Very strange stuff here, but you need to understand Hosea's early chapters there. Now, there is a strange contrast Remember in Revelation 18, verse 7, we, Mystery Babylon, the har- harlot said in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow, shall see no sorrow. In contrast to Israel, who is, des- is described as divorced in Isaiah 54, Jeremiah 3, and Hosea 2. She's also portrayed as being widowed in Lamentations by Jeremiah in Isaiah 54. So Israel... Now, what makes this interesting, a priest could not marry a divorced woman. And Christ is our high priest. So there's a clash of idioms here, if nothing else. Now, the bride of Christ in the Scripture, 2 Corinthians 11 and Ephesians 5, as examples, is the church. In fact, she's presented as a chaste virgin. Is she really chaste? Of course not. She's got all kinds of blemishes, but the blood of Christ has dealt with all of that. So she's presented as a chaste virgin. And who is the bridegroom? John 3.22 nails it, if nothing else does. Jesus Christ, of course. He's the bridegroom. He so identifies himself that way. Now he gave them a promise in John 14. 
My father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. And this you, you, you is a reference, of course, to the harpazo. Jesus comes back twice, once for the church. That's what we call the harpazo. That's what that Paul calls the harpazo. And uh, once, which is his second coming in power, which is what we're going to see unfold in chapter 19. Let's back up and refresh our memories on what really occurs in the ancient form of a Jewish wedding. Initially, there was the contract, the betrothal, the ketubah. And, and uh, that w- involved the payment of a purchase price. The bride was set apart and sanctified. If this was violated, it was considered adultery. Even though they're not married yet, they're betrothed. It's a very sacred thing. That's the way Joseph and Mary were um, so designated. And there's plenty of verses on this. Now, we can go through all of those sometime, but... Um, the bridegroom departs to the father's house, leaving the bride to, be, to stay and be sanctified. He, the bridegroom departs to the father's house, typically to add a room addition to that house. And the bride, in the meantime, is preparing for his imminent return. She does not know when he comes back. It's a surprise. And that's part of the game that's played here. He's busy preparing. She has to be patient and wait for him, not knowing when he comes, and it's usually in the middle of the night. As a big surprise. And uh, then there comes a surprise gathering. And there's examples of that in the scripture, allusions to it. And uh, the hoopah, the actual wedding takes place. And then there's a seven-day feast, typically. That's the marriage supper, where they celebrate uh, the, uh, the wedding. And uh, so, so that's the j- typical pattern, of course. And that's, you'll find that in the scriptures. You can search them out. It'll be in the notes. I won't take the time here. Um, the marriage is fulfilled in, in, with regards to the church. The covenant was established, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25. The purchase price was established, namely the blood of Jesus Christ made the purchase. The bride is then set apart, and that's, that's what constitutes our admonitions in Ephesians 5 and all through 1 Corinthians and the book of Hebrews and so forth. And uh, we're reminded of the covenant again and again. Uh, and uh, the bridegroom left for, the, for his father's house The escort to accompany him upon his return to gather his bride is alluded to in 1 Thessalonians 4, that we call the the Harpazo. So the pattern is very, very interesting. Again, you see, to the Jewish mind, prophecy is not prediction fulfillment alone, it's pattern. And this is one of the most important ones, one of the most fundamental ones. It's interesting to realize that God, throughout the Bible, uses the marriage as his way of communicating intimacy. The intimacy between us and God is modeled after marriage courtship. And uh, perhaps the most, one of the most dramatic examples is, strangely enough, is that Christ is spoken of by Paul as the last Adam. Well, that implies the first Adam may be a model of some kind here. And I want you to recall that strange day when Eve had partaken of the forbidden fruit. Adam was not there, apparently. When he gets home, he finds out there's big news. Now, we infer from a couple of verses that before the fall, they were clothed with light. They were eternal. Um, when uh, Adam comes home, he finds Eve's really blown it. And you can picture if it was us guys, we would say to Eve something like, Boy, kid, have you messed up. That's okay, I'll pray for you. You know. Now, I'm still clean. See, I'm still unblemished. But, gee, I'm sure sorry for you. Boy, it's going to be tough for you. No, he didn't do that at all. We know from 2 Timothy 2.14, or 1 Timothy 2.14, that um, uh, Eve was deceived, but Adam was not. Adam knew what he was doing. And what we discover is Adam loved Eve so much that he chose to join her in her predicament rather than be without her. And because he did, that led to offspring and God's plan of redemption through the seed of the woman and so forth. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not condoning what <laughs> the, the, the sin. I don't mean it that way. But in the, in the type, in the model, we have Adam as a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ who loved us so much that he 
became sin for us. And by his doing that, we can gain an eligibility through his grace to eternal life. Um, if it hadn't been for Adam joining her, Eve would have been eternally lost. But because Adam joined her, and through them God had developed a plan of redemption, um, the seed of the woman and so forth. So it's interesting whether you're talking about Adam and Eve as, a, as an example of God's relationship to us, or whether you're talking about the book of Ruth, where you have Boaz and Ruth, the Gentile bride of Boaz, that all models, again, the kinsman redeemer. Uh, all through the scripture, you find um, these models. It's interesting if you, you'll find, actually, um, I think seven Gentile brides in the scripture. What's interesting about that is you'll find in none of those cases the death recorded. Now, obviously, they died, but it's interesting just as an editorial comment that in no case were any of the Gentile brides death. Obviously, Ruth died, but that's not recorded. Um, I think that's significant. But then I guess I tend to be a mystic. Let's move on. Hal Lindsay always calls me that, and affectionately, of course. <laughs> um, there's an interesting thing that occurs at the Last Supper I just wanted to highlight. It's recorded in Luke 22. It's also echoed in Mark 14 and Matthew 26. He said to them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. The Passover consisted of four cups. And the cup of blessing is the third cup. And from Paul's remarks, we understand that was the cup he used. He didn't finish. There's an unfinished cup left over that he will take in the next few verses at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'll not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God come. Well, that's what's coming here, gang. Now, the bridegroom, of course, we know who that is. John the Baptist is a friend of the bridegroom, not the bride. He says so. Um, there's, of course, the banquet is all through the scripture. And the bride, of course, enjoys a unique relationship as Jesus exemplifies in John 17. But um, John does a strange thing in verse 10. He says, I fell at his feet to worship him. This, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Jesus is what it's all about. Every prophecy, in fact, I would suggest every idiom, every quaint little rule in the Torah, they all point ultimately to Jesus Christ. But it's interesting, he does not allow himself to be worshipped. Um, Daniel has the same experience. Angels do not allow themselves to be worshipped. The good ones, that is. There's one that did, and he got himself in a lot of trouble. Um, that's why in at the end of the book of Joshua chapter 5, when that person that Joshua encounters, who's the captain of the Lord's host, sword drawn, he says, take off your shoes, you're on hallowed ground. He allows himself, to, he commands himself to be worshipped. It's obviously Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ fought the battle of Jericho. And you need to understand that, because that's a foreshadowing of the whole book of, jo of uh, Revelation. Well, then we get to the, verse 11, and I saw heaven open, John says, and behold, a white horse... And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. The coming king. And uh, you could probably spend a lifetime, literally, going through the verses that allude to this. There's a beginning for you in, the, in your notes. In the Psalms, of course, is a great place to start. Psalm 2, 45, 46, and 47 and uh, 50 and 68 and so on, uh, and all through Isaiah. But he, also Daniel, Joel, Habakkuk, Zechariah. We'll touch on some of these as we go. This is the big event. This is the, uh, the, the, the Lord coming. I want to remind you what the Lord did at the synagogue of Nazareth when he opened his ministry. It's recorded in Luke chapter 4 where he has given the, the uh, book of Isaiah and he opens it up and reads it. And uh, what he reads, you can find in Luke 4, but you can also find it in Isaiah 61, 
where the Lord reads as he opens this ministry in uh, Nazareth, he says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closes the book and declares to them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, before the, 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 the morning's over, they try to throw him off a cliff, but he slips away. What's interesting is if you go back and compare what he read in Luke 4 with Isaiah 61, you'll discover something strange. He stopped reading at a comma, closed the book, said, this day is this passage fulfilled in your ears. What's instructive is to notice the part he didn't read at that time. And that is, and the day of vengeance of our God. That's part of his mandate too, but it wasn't to be fulfilled on his first coming. But it is the mandate that he is going to take on in his second coming, um, as we might say in our vernacular, in spades. Um, continuing at Revelation 19, verse 12, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. These are diadems, not Stephanos. These are kingdoms. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. That's one of John's favorite titles. He, uh, he uses it in one of his letters and he uses it in the opening of his, his uh, gospel. His name is called the Word of God. He is indeed the Word incarnate. His eyes were as a flame of fire. He, I remember seeing a bumper sticker saying, Jesus is coming soon, and boy, is he angry. A little irreverent, perhaps, but not inaccurate. Now, back when we were in chapter 14, we saw the Lamb, the 144,000 commandos, you remember? Seven angels, one with the eternal gospel, one announcing, you know, at, at, at declaring what's coming, the doom of Babylon, and so forth. And then we had these three angels at the end call for a grape harvest with the, the sickles and so forth. And that's what we're seeing climaxed here. And, uh, there we, in Revelation 14, it said, the wine press was strodden outside the city, and the blood came out of the wine press, even unto the horse's bridles by the space of 1,600 furlongs. And we, at that time, took a quick look at Basra. Isaiah 63 describes the second coming of Christ in ways that shock many people. In Isaiah 63, it says, Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? And other garments that are splattered with red. This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? If you've treaded in the wine press, you, the, the, the grape juice sprinkles all over your clothes. That's what it's looked like, except it's not grape juice, it's blood. And... Uh, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the, uh, of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled on my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. That's what's going on here. From our point of view, it's glorious. King of king and Lord of lords. From the world's point of view, it's terrifying. And uh, I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury had upheld me, and I will tread down the people in my anger, and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. And the passage goes on. It's very interesting that from Megiddo down to Petra is a distance of 1,600 furlongs, the same that as closes chapter 14. One of the things that... Um, most of us fixate on, we know that Jesus returns to the Mount of Olives. But Arnold Fruchtenbaum and other scholars are, who have done a lot of homework in this area uh, feel that what precedes his return in victory to the Mount of Olives is this errand <laughs> to redeem the faithful that have fled Jerusalem and in accordance to his instructions in Matthew 24 and uh, have sequestered themselves in uh, uh, the mountains of uh, Edom. 
namely Petra, which has a, a room for over a million people there to hide because of the unusual, it's like a sheepfold. A sheepfold is a, an area that has only one entrance, and it is like that. There's a very narrow, literally, uh, uh, you couldn't get a truck through it. You have to go on donkeys, or you can get a little rickshaw. But I mean, it's it's a it's a the, the seek, as they call it, is a very very narrow gateway into this area, and uh, uh, this apparently is, uh, and that's why it's called a sheepfold. That's what the word Basra means, and uh, uh, this what its original name was also. So it's a it's it's a view that uh, uh, the refuge in Edom. If you want to check out our commentaries on this area. Continuing, the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, uh, fine linen, white and clean. Every time I see this, I'm reminded of my daughter. When she was small, she came to me and said, Is there, are there animals in heaven? It must be, Dad, because there's horses. She loves horses. She's quite a rider. And uh, I says, well, I, I guess so. That's right. I know there are going to be cats. She says, really, Dad? I says, absolutely. Where else would they get the strings for the harps? And uh, she almost hit me. <laughs> I believe in the spiritual gifts. Mine happens to be flippancy. But uh, Re Revelation 19, verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. It's interesting when you visit some of the art museums, you find these artists that have tried to portray the second coming of Christ, and they it's rather grotesque. They actually have a sword coming out of his mouth. That's what they're trying to be literal. And obviously, it's an idiom for the Word of God, which is quick and powerful and, mighty, and sharper than a two edged sword. Hebrews 4.12, for those of you who want to tra track that down. Um, and it's with it's, it, 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 it's interesting. Nowhere in the scripture, in the areas so called Battle of Armageddon and all this, is there any struggle? There's no struggle. He declares and it's done. It's his word that decimates his enemies. Um, he smites them uh, with the word of God. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that is the word of God, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. That's, that, that occurs four times in the scripture. It's an identity of him. He's going to rule uh, seriously. They tread at the wine press. And this, now, try to absorb this phrase. They tread at the wine press of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. You know, I think we uh, as students uh, uh, have no ability to grasp what that might mean. Can you imagine God as mad as he gets? The fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. Um, it's disturbing just to try to think about it. It's disturbing just to try to imagine it. I don't think we can. I don't think we have any capacity to do that. Okay. Now, this is not the rapture. We talked about that. This is the revelation. He's not coming in the air. He's coming to the earth. He's going to be spattered with blood of his enemies. We're going to be there. We'll watch it. You and I are going to be there. He's coming not for the saints. He's already done that, but with us. He will have caught us up earlier. We will have been in heaven. We will have participated in the Bema seat, the judgment seat, not judgment like, it's a judgment like in an athletic contest where they give out the gold medal, silver, whatever kind of thing. Um, it's a Bema seat. It's a, it's a gift of rewards for faithful service. We will participate in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Um, there's some debates among some scholars whether it's up in heaven before we get back or just the first thing when we get back. I won't go down that path. Who, we're going to be there in either case. Not for the sins, but with us. He comes for us in the air. Here, here he's coming back to the earth with us. He doesn't need us. Don't get the idea that we're somehow going to be, you know, have weapons and be part of the army that's going to defeat the enemy. No, <laughs> he'll take care of that. We're just uh, there. And he comes back not to comfort, but to conquer. He is the conqueror. 
And he's not now here protecting us in heaven. He's to rule, rule with us on the earth. Those are exciting times. And that's not that far away. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. On his thigh may strike us strange, but that's because we're not familiar with horseback warfare. That's where a knight and so forth on, on a thing would have an emblazoned coat or something, or you know, a, a label on his thigh, on, on, his, on his armor. It's busy sitting on a saddle. It makes sense. It does make sense that we're not familiar with those idioms because it's of a different time. But um, I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. This is another supper. Don't, I don't, some people think this is the marriage supper of the Lamb. If so, it's a pretty grisly affair. No, I don't think that's it at all. Come to my wedding. Let me tell you what we're going to do. You know? No, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> and one of the, uh, I love it when in Heinsohn, some of these conferences, when he's, when he's talking about the post-tribulationists, because these people that think that the, God is going to take his bride and put him through the great tribulation and beat the living daylights out of her to get her ready for the, for the marriage supper. And it's a colorful way of, you know, can you imagine what a proposition that is? <laughs> you know, no, no, no. <laughs> Real mixing of metaphors. And that would be here too. This is, this, there are two suppers. This is the, the supper that's dramatizing the, the carnage of uh, destruction. And uh, it goes on. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and the armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against it. Well, one other thing about that previous verse. Uh, <clears throat> in, ver in these verses here where it talks about the, the, the fowls of the air eating the flesh of kings and captains and mighty men, flesh of horses, etc., etc., there's a very similar amount of language like this in Ezekiel 39. And that's one of the reasons that uh, many scholars, like Hal Lindsey and others, assume that the Gog Magog thing is tied to this because they see the same language of the birds eating the flesh on the battlefield. And that's not the only reason, but that's one of the things. And uh, that's one that, uh, I, from my point of view, I don't think the, uh, this idea of the bird, this was a very common uh, graphic portrayal of a, a, a catastrophic battle to have the landscape littered with bodies and have the carrion's feet on them. And uh, I don't think it's unique. I don't think there's only one occasion when that happens. So uh, to me, this doesn't identify, this is not the insufficient reason to put the Magog battle as part of this, this scenario here, frankly. But I mention that so you won't be surprised when you see that uh, in, the, in the passage. Moving on. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. I can't imagine this. Of all the things in the Bible that makes no sense to me, this one is a strange. I cannot imagine this world system and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered to make war with God. Get serious, gang. That's crazy. Uh, but they do. And this is exactly what you find in Psalm 2. One of the interesting exercises I encourage you to do is take a sheet of paper and diagram Psalm 2. There are three people talking across the table. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, the Father and the Son. That's interesting. Saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. In other words, that's what the kings of the earth are quoted as saying. Hey, let's, let's get together. We're going to get rid of their controls over us. Huh? Let's break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. <laughs> then we get the rejoinder. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. No kidding. It's almost as if they're sitting there chuckling about the, the arrogance that's being portrayed here. 
Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon the holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Then some advice comes up forth. Be now wise, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. And blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Interesting psalm. Well, moving back to Revelation 19. The beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. Notice who does the miracles. It's the, du- the second guy of the duet. The beast, that is the, 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 the main leader, was taken. And with him, the false... That's why many people say the beast is really a, 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 a kingdom, an empire. Well, it is. But it's also a person that has a head wound, etc., etc. The beast was taken, and with him, the false prophet that wrought the miracles before him. It was those miracles that he used to get people to worship him, and he also, the false prophet, had the power to enforce a forced worship. That's why the, the, the event in, in Daniel chapter 3 is such a parallel. With which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. You know what's interesting we're going to discover in the next chapter that Satan will be bound for a thousand years. At the end of that thousand years, he'll be turned loose. And he leads the world again into rebellion. And once again, he's, uh, the, the Lord straightens that all out. Then Satan is thrown at that time into the lake burning as fire and brimstone. But what's interesting, when you get to that verse, you'll notice that these two characters are still there, still burning. The burning of fire and brimstone is not annihilation. It never ends. It's not really physical. It's out t- time is a physical property. It's forever. That's a real long time. Forever. And uh, Satan is then cast in, but his two buddies who are there are still there. They're not annihilated. They're still burning. Um, but here they're both cast in the lake of fire, burning with fire and brimstone. Their boss will be joining them after a thousand years. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth. There again, it's an idiom for the word of God. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Again, we're in dealing in medieval battlefield idioms here. But that's fine. Now, in Zechariah 14, there's a very familiar passage, but it seems an appropriate place to insert it here. Zechariah says, God says to Zechariah, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. I want you to notice that phrase, all nations. That really bothers me. What that tells me is that the day will come when the United States will no longer support Israel. Uh, not that we have to approve all their policies and so forth, but we have stood in the past um, supporting their right to exist. We're unique in that we do so. Um, I really don't worry about Israel. They're facing some tough times, but I know God's in control. It's all laid out. I know how it comes out. There's more passages about the restoration of Israel than probably any other topic in the Scripture. I do worry about America because America is not mentioned in prophecy. It's very conspicuous by its absence of mention, at least to us. That's not a big issue in Europe, (laughs) but it is to us. And there are many theories as to why we're not mentioned in prophecy. One of those theories that we're somehow aligned with other nations. Well, the other nations are not in good shape either. 
Uh, another theory is that we suffer an economic deterioration by then, and there, there are very impressive arguments, quantitative arguments, that the twin deficits, the, the, the federal deficit, budget deficits, and the trade deficits, both are gigantic and growing and, and will eventually bring, our, bring us down. Um, Others feel that we may be the victims of a strategic use of uh, weapons of mass destruction, either a nuclear exchange or an EMP attack or whatever. I do worry because I think that as long as we are supporting Israel, I think that keeps God protecting us because of Genesis 12, verse 2 and 3. But I think the day will come, um, and it may be too soon for me, but the day may come when we will waffle on our commitment to Israel, and I think that will relieve God's obligation to forestall his overdue judgment on America. In any case, I do see from verse 2 of Zechariah 14 that God will gather all nations. That doesn't mean there might not be an exception here and there, but I think the term implies all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken and so forth. And what happens then? Verse 3, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. When did he fight in the day of battle? Numbers 14 speaks of the book of the wars of the Lord. He has fought more battles than we have any idea. We know that he fought Jericho personally. It says so at the end of Joshua, Joshua 5. Um, that's when he fought in the day of battle. That's interesting. He's going to go fight those nations. I'm glad we're on his side. And then once he does that, of course, he wins. Then it goes on in verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. If you visit Jerusalem... When you're standing at the Temple Mount and you look east, you see the Mount of Olives, of course. Prominent on the Mount of Olives, right across from the Temple, is a hotel. It was originally the Intercontinental Hotel. When then I first went to Israel uh, in the early 70s, it was the Intercontinental Hotel. And uh, uh, it was because of its connection with Pan Am that we were able to arrange our particular situation. Anyway. Um, we didn't realize it because we knew nothing. We just went there to look around. Uh, we didn't realize that was sort of dis that was disparaged by the Jews because they feel it's, a, it's violating a lot of things to have that there. And so it's not, it, it then changed hands. It's no longer under Pan Am. It's called now the Seven Arches. It's designed with seven arches, and it looks like. But they call it that now, and it's, it's, a, it's an operating hotel. And it's a popular place to go, not to stay, but to look from there. There's a gorgeous overlook to the old city to take pictures and so on. But if you do a little homework, you'll find some interesting things. Uh, I, it's my understanding that when Pan Am first built the hotel there, uh, they got started and had to redo the foundations because they found out that there is a fault line, ge uh, geo geological fault line, through the Mount of Olives running east and west. And um, so they had to do some, make some changes in their building uh, uh, permits. And I think that's kind of interesting. Um, because apparently that fault line is waiting for the pressure of a foot. <laughs> because um, you'll stand at that day of Mount of Olives before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a great valley. And half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. So uh, I think that's kind of interesting. Well, for the next session, we're going to enter into an area that's probably the biggest divide in the body of Christ. Chapter 20 of the book of Revelation deals with what is called the millennium. And uh, it, millennium being a, a term for a thousand years. Milli being thousand, annum being a year. A thousand, millennium means a thousand years. And uh, for next time, I'd like you to read chapter 20 carefully. And you might also read Isaiah 65. Most of what we know about the millennium comes from Isaiah rather than from Revelation. But one of the questions 
you want to deal with yourself and come to your own conclusions about, is that a literal thing or is it just a symbolic thing? You, I should warn you that probably, I don't know the exact statistics, but I'd guess about 9 out of 10 churches are what we call amillennial. They don't believe in a literal millennium. They take this passage symbolically. And um, uh, obviously you can tell that we take it literally. But you need to understand that this is a very, very fundamental split among pastors. And people who are not that much into eschatology anyway, typically, have a, a split on this issue. You're either amillennial or premillennial. You either believe there really is a millennium or you don't believe in any millennium. There are some other views, and I'll cover those, but that, that's the dominant view, what's called the amillennial view. In and of itself, it may not seem like that big a thing, except it has all kinds of grave repercussions. So this is going to be a very, very important session next time, and it will uh, it'll be followed by the final session of the whole series where we'll talk about the eternal state, which is don't confuse the millennium from what follows the millennium. They're quite different. And yet there's lots of misunderstandings about all those issues. We'll try to deal with that head on. Uh, let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Well, Father, we rejoice as we think about the anticipated return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in glory and in power. Oh, Father, as we study the dismal histories of mankind, making a continual mess of things, we look forward to that day when the King of kings and Lord of lords comes to rule. And yet, Father, we look even more with more apprehension and excitement with his gathering us to be ever with him. Our words fail to even articulate how thrilling that is, Father. We thank you that you have gone to such extremes to redeem such miserable creatures as ourselves. We come before you, Father, acknowledging our sins, our presumption, our ingratitude. We just thank you, Father, that you've promised that if we confess these, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we seek that, Father, for many reasons, not the least of which that we might have presence before you, that we might come before you with our thanksgiving. And Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have brought us to this moment in time. We thank you, Father, that you've revealed these things to us. We pray, Father, that the lessons not be wasted. We pray, Father, that you would use each one of these passages to illuminate what you would have of us in response, that we each might be more fruitful stewards of the opportunities before us. But above all, Father, that we might each grow in grace and the knowledge of that lamb that was slain on our behalf. Oh, Father, we just do pray that your purpose would be accomplished in each of our lives as we commit ourselves without any reservation into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.